on it too so quickly. It overlooks. It is pretty up here. Yeah. yeah, what is this over here? Is this. Oh, you can't see the Coliseum. Look at that view. Oh, someone left a little teddy bear. Jonestown Memorial. These plaques were dedicated May 29th, 2011. More than 150 relatives and friends contributed to their creation and installation a sincere appreciation to Evergreen Cemetery. Rest in peace. Wow, this is, look at that. There's a little scanner. I'll scrap and scan it. Hello everybody. So, Kristen here. Welcome to my channel. This is Her Week in Travels. I This is a more somber video. I'm at the location of the memorial site for the 412 unnamed victims from the Jonestown Massacre, I would like to call it. It's um, I've spent a few months now researching this. This is probably one of the sadder things I've ever had to read about and learn about. So as you can see, here's a plaque. It says, in memory of the victims of Jonestown tragedy, Guyana Emergency Relief Committee. So what happened was in 1978, well, this started back in the early 70s. I've, and I've also chosen to leave out the name of the cult leader out of respect of the victims. So, um, I, I didn't think I would be at such a loss of words. Like I said, I did months and months and months of research on this. And now I just don't know what to even say, but in 1978, 918 people took their lives, whether or not they did it willingly or forcibly. And it was children, it was elderly, it was the sick, it was everyone in between. Um, this man that started this cult, it started in San Francisco in the early 70s. Then, of course, because no one wants a cult in their town, it got pushed all over the place. Eventually, they wound up in Guyana. Guyana, South America, where they built this place called the People's Temple. And it was a place that was heavily armed guards and they were supposed to be there to love and be their own people. And let me get around to the front. You know, a place where there was no racism. A place where people, black, white, Asian, black, white, Asian, everyone in between could just live in harmony and peace. And their leader, who told them that was going to happen, I'm still looking for Christine's name, preached all these prophecies, lead them to, you know, I don't, a better place, basically. And then he, um, from all his drug abuse, 
a cult leader, which again, I'm not saying his name because more people know his name than they do know about the 918 victims that he killed. So we're leaving his name out of it. But he, uh, he basically went nuts and he tortured tortured them basically through tyranny he was you know these people relied on him they looked up to him they revered him almost as a god and some some people not everybody but some people really did see that he he was their messiah um other people referred that i've seen in videos where they literally were like i thought he walked on water i had thought that highly of him so this wasn't just a man that was, he spent years and years and years grooming these people, in my opinion, to love him, to, to rely on him for everything they need, only for him to turn on them and then groom them to do the suicide. So that was, that was the sad, was towards the end. And look at this cute teddy bear, some of the cute teddy bear. I wanted it, I wanted to bring something too, but I didn't know, I didn't know what to bring. 918 people died all because of one man who groomed them and um he did this for decades it wasn't just like it wasn't just like hey everyone drink drink this and the the term everyone's heard oh they must have drank the kool-aid it came from the jonestown massacre which is horrible that they're now forever linked with that term because they didn't even drink Kool-Aid, they drank flavored aid and um, it was not Kool-Aid. But now forever, they'll always be like, oh, they drink the Kool-Aid. Whenever anything, anyone, someone does anything stupid, oh, they drink the Kool-Aid. What he was doing for years and years and years, because they were lying on him for everything, obviously, telling, he was telling them that they had nowhere to go because obviously no one wants that in this country especially no one wants communism and at that time in the 70s you know that's why they went to South America Guyana because they wanted to be able to make their own rules their own laws live their own way without people telling them to be this way or that way. They just wanted to be communist and share everything equally. So he was telling them, you can't go to America. They don't want you there. You can't go. You can't even go to Russia right now because I, you know, I'm talking to the Russian government and they, you know, it's just not happening at the moment. Like he was feeding them so many lies and what are they gonna do? They had nowhere else to turn to. They had no family their family was Jonestown as the years went by and the more and more he told them there was a stigma built around Jonestown obviously the more they believed him but he was telling them that like the American government like everybody on the outside looking in didn't like it they didn't like the people's temple they didn't like what they were doing and they were gonna take everybody down in one way or another. And they were gonna start with probably the babies, you know? And I know that for a lot of those people there, that's all that they had to look forward to was their children. And that was their family. And when he told them, well, they're gonna take your children and they're gonna torture them. They're not just gonna kill them, they're gonna torture them. Then they're gonna take you and they're gonna torture you. They're gonna take your mom and they're gonna torture them. And he wasn't the best way to do this is instead of them coming and taking our lives, we're gonna take our own life respectfully. And that's when the mass suicide came in. He would even perform max mock suicides with them where his 10, 20 closest parishioners, whatever, his 10 to 20 closest followers, as you will, um, he would, ha you know, come in for a meeting for her. let's sit down and discuss what's going on for the week or whatever they would do in the cult. And I'm not trying to disrespect anyone that followed him because sad, but 
you would prepare actual Kool-Aid for them. And it, not flavor aid, Kool-Aid. And because I remember when I watched the tapes, one of the survivors had said, wow, this was unusual that we got juice because we didn't, weren't allowed to drink juice. They weren't allowed to drink alcohol. They weren't allowed, none of that. So, oh, he also did that once with wine. He gave them wine and then he told them he um, poisoned them and that they only had five minutes left to live and he didn't poison, poison them. It was a test to see if they were true you know, his true people are really gonna stay with him through all of it. And so anyways, what happened was, I believe it was NBC News, a news affiliate team, I, I believe it was NBC, got word, you know, got this people's temple and that there was people there that wanted to do an interview because they had been asking and reaching out for an interview, I guess, for a long time to the cult leader, which again, I'm not saying his name. And he, no, he refused because obviously he doesn't want people who aren't brainwashed by him looking in and seeing what he is doing because obviously it's sick and it's wrong. So he would refuse the interviews. Well, finally, so they came all the way up to Guyana, which from my understanding was like a three hour long boat trip followed by a three hour long bus right in the middle of the um, rainforest. I mean, this is South America we're talking about. There's nothing out there. Made it all the way out there. Um, everything seemed normal. Everyone seemed happy. Everyone was putting on a happy face. They even put on a show and a performance for them. They had dinner. And by the next day, I guess the reporter would, had been getting notes slipped to him from the people saying we want out we um but then there was talk of people wanting to leave so when that happened the reporter was like well then that's all you know I'll get a truck pile everyone in and it was literally like maybe 20 plus people and it was a mix between white people people African Americans Asian people it was a full-on mix of different people they wanted to leave so he's like okay I'll get get a flight out for everyone um, it wasn't enough for everyone to leave obviously one tiny little plane isn't gonna be able to take away 20 people so he had to call in a second plane and it took too long and everyone there was like this is taking too long we know we know him he's gonna send his guys after us and they're gonna kill us and that's exactly what happened. There was a truck that came up and shot at the reporter. There was also a congresswoman there and um, the or killed the reporter. The congresswoman survived. So then he got word of that. He let them know back there at the, the temple that, hey, this just happened. We just killed we just killed these people and he made them know that it wasn't wasn't me like it wasn't him that killed the people he's like we all killed we all killed that news or that reporter so he let them know that when they when the police come he's they're gonna take them all which wouldn't have happened they would have just blamed it on him but they didn't know that and they didn't know any better and that's when it started with get the cyanide get the vats get the vats he kept saying and they would get these big vats and fill them up with cyanide ta tablets and a bunch of flav flavor aid packets and then just dump water in and he made people get in line and start scooping up cups of it and drinking it and forcing it into baby's mouths and the people that they couldn't get to take it they would just inject their arms um, forcibly so people were either committing suicide on their own or people were just being forced into death. And there was one woman, um, Christine, I can't remember her last name, who stood up and actually, you know, like, there's more to life. We shouldn't just commit suicide. We should think this through, look at the babies. We should at least let them survive. And no matter how hard she pleaded, they didn't let her 
Um, obviously, they didn't listen to her. Um, people were telling her that she was stupid, that she was there because of him. She was only alive because of him. And in the end, she was one of the last people to, she wouldn't even get in line. She was one of the last people killed. And they, um, she was killed by injection of cyanide. So, this is, this is their final resting place. They dumped them all in one giant hole. And I shouldn't say all of them. There was 412 people that were left unclaimed. People can either get their bodies um, out of the freezer truck because they couldn't afford to or because they were just unnamed. They were, they didn't know who they were. And they had nowhere to go. No one would take them. Luckily here at the cemetery in Oakland, they were more than willing, I guess, which is it's really sad to think all they wanted in the, to begin with was a home and a family where they could be accepted without prejudice and racism and, and they just wanted to live a happy life by their own rules. There's really nothing wrong with that, I guess. Only for them to end up in a mass burial site. It's, I mean... They're not unnamed. That's why they have these plaques here for them to list all the different... It's children, it's elderly, it's everybody that lived at Jonestown. There's quite a bit of history on it online, but coming here is completely different. And they got a pretty good view being overlooking Oakland here. Nice view of the bay. There's a Coliseum. It's gorgeous here. It's a lot nicer than Guyana. Okay, everybody. Well, that's where I'm going to end this here. Bye. I'm not really sure what this part of the cemetery is. They said the scattering. Oh, I'll have to look at the thing again. But this is like just different. I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really sure what this is all about. This memorial plaques everywhere for people. These all must be people. Look at this. David Furman at home in his garden. Oh, are these people who were not buried in a cemetery? Maybe? 
Like there were people that had their ashes. <gasps> oh, these are people who had their ashes scattered. Oh, I get it now. Oh, I'm dense. Oh, this is a cool idea. Because I've always wondered that for me. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get cremated. This is a cool idea. Mm, where's that sign at? It's up here. Now, the scattering garden. Huh. So cute.